separately. Horses, not separately? No. But there were, I mean, there was um, two or three horses that that they owned together like, and they didn't have just one for this child and one for that, that, that I could recall. But they had them together, but they had uh, plenty of horses that they had trained and rode. Do you, do you want to tell them about the cliffs, going off the cliffs, for the swimming times that they would do, the children would do? Yeah, uh, down by the river there was uh, on the opposite, the side that we were on, that our house was on, was just a gentle slope up to the house. But on the other side there was a high cliff, and uh, there was a special place where they uh, could dive down from the edge of the cliff into the river. But then often what they do is just take the horse down, ride the horse into the middle of the river, and then they could jump off the horse um, into the river and do their swimming. But my, fa when, my father says that he had his horse so trained, his name was Tinto, and he calls it his horse. His brother would probably argue with me, but my dad claims the horse was his only. <laughs> He would actually jump off the cliff on the horse into the water. So he had the horse so trained. Um, and then they also had, and what's funny is my dad was inseparable from his horse. It was like his pet. The horse would follow him around. When I went back to Ecuador in 1998 and met some of my grandmother's old friends, I walked up and I knew instantly who I was because they, they said, there is the con, we see the nose. Apparently I have my dad's and my grandfather's <laughs> nose. So they picked me out of a crowd because of my nose. And then the first thing they, I said, I was Billy's daughter. And they said, oh, Tinto. And they started telling me all about this horse that my dad used to have and ride around. <laughs> Um, they also had, my grandmother had a pet parrot. Was it a parrot or a cockatoo that you, that you had that my father loved to, to tease because this bird refused to fly. So it would walk everywhere they went. So when they went to church, the parrot would follow them to church and he would church. walk. <laughs> right up to the front often. My grandfather, my grandfather would be giving the altar call at the end of the service and asking if anyone wanted to come forward to be saved, and up would walk the parish up the aisle, finally at the church. And the other thing it would do was follow my father to play basketball. But it wasn't the smartest of pair. It, it could fly, it just didn't like to. So in the middle of the game, it would, it would walk up, and then it would hop on the basketball goal and wait for them to throw a basketball, then it would fall down, <laughs> fly right back up, and sit on the basketball hoop waiting to get hit again. So, but my dad's favorite pet, well, other than Tinto, was named Herbie. He was a monkey, a spider monkey, which are the kind of the smaller monkeys. Um, and they treated that like a little baby. They would dress him in clothes. His sisters, my dad would get irritated because he'd find his monkey dressed in baby doll clothes. <laughs> and they would hold him like a baby and walk around and take the monkey everywhere, which the, the Keech ones thought was funny because they would have eaten him if they could have. But this was their pet. So they always knew that he was about to go to the bathroom because they would be holding. All of a sudden his tummy would get really, really hot, and they'd quickly throw him down. <laughs> But he had, a, he had some animosity with the dog. And the dog, I think, belonged to another missionary family that was on furlough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had it chained up to a post. And Herbie would climb the post and uh -huh. would yell and taunt in monkey language the dog. So the dog would run around in circles around the pole, getting tied up, trying to get at the, dog, at the monkey. Um, and then they started having more and more trouble with Herbie because they would take him into town. And people loved him. He was such a, so friendly and everything. But he started stealing bananas behind people's backs and started stealing trinkets from the store. So eventually they had to give Herbie to another family because... Yeah, we had taught him to be a good Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and the Kichuans got so angry because he was stealing from them that they had to get rid of him and give him to another family. But they didn't eat him. It was okay. So those were some of the interesting pets they had. They also had Turkey. turkeys and they had chickens. Um, and something interesting my grandfather did was the chickens they had there in Ecuador that I guess the Spanish had brought over earlier, 
they were very weak and they didn't have a whole lot of meat on them. So one of the things my grandfather did for the people is he brought a special kind of um, of chicken down. I think it was called a Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. and introduced that to Ecuador. He was one of the first people to bring it. But he learned that he couldn't give them to the Native Americans because they would eat them. Sorry, it's Native South Americans. He would eat, they would eat them. So he sold them for a low price. And when I went, the great-great-grandchildren of those chickens were still running around. So um, that was really cool. That was one of the ways he benefited. So there's a lot more you can do as a missionary than, than preaching and teaching, there's a lot of impact that you can have with a hammer, with a, with a lesson book, um, and just by loving people. Grandma was a nurse, and they would bring her, their chickens to her to be treated. Yeah. I think a donkey wasn't well, I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> but the chicken got better, didn't it? I guess so. I, whatever I did, it evidently, it evidently helped what I else. It just got better by itself. <laughs> They were having trouble with um, with diseases, and Grandma brought immunizations down, and she would immunize the people. And so a lot of lives were saved because of the nursing skills she had gotten in college. So um, now we're going to watch. I think I've got a short video to show them, Grandma, of, of what of that interview you did with another homeschool kid. But would you rather tell them about what happened with um, with Jim Elliott and all of them? You want to watch the video? If they want to see the video, they'd probably like to see the video. Okay. Well, or we can save the video for next week. Do you if want she to wants to time? say, yeah, okay. she wants to. Well, we we can save the video for another time when you're not here. Oh. Um, right now they're reading um, "Through the Gates of Splendor" by oh, Elizabeth oh, Elliot. Oh, oh yeah. Can oh. you tell them about Elizabeth Elliot a little bit and her living with you? Yeah. Jim and Pete um, were. Two missionaries that came down with another mission, and um, they were the first ones to go into where the Alcas were. Uh, Betty and it, Betty Elliot lived with us until um, because Jim had said that he didn't want to marry her unless he was sure she could take jungle life. So uh, he put her down in the house where we were, where we lived, and on the station where we lived, to see if she could live in the jungle. <laughs> in very particular. And she did very well, so he finally married Betty. By the way, Valerie is uh, in, uh, lives where, near where we are now, so uh, Betty's daughter, Valerie, has uh, been down to visit us, and Bill took me up to her house, to her church, I should say, one Sunday. So it's uh, good to be with them. But in those early years, when um, Jim first went into the jungle um, area, the Alka area, I should say, uh, was when the Alkas had risen up and killed a whole bunch of um, people. Loggers? The logging men there to cut down the trees and the oil men? Yeah, yeah, they, they'd always do that. Uh-huh. But also another, um, another group, I'm trying to recall just who they were. But anyhow, they, um, the Alphas were still very savage. And um, later on, I can't remember how Betty first got to go into there, but Betty Elliott did finally go in. It was after her husband had been killed, I think. Well, I think back to now. And Valerie had gone into the jungle. Uh-huh. Now, the the Alka name, their their real tribe's name is the Wadurani, right? Wadurani. But why did the Kichwans call them Alka? It's a word, word for, like, savage, wild. So here, Grandma and Grandpa were serving with with people, the Quechua Indians, who sometimes didn't wear clothes, but they considered the Alcas to be even more to be savage because they would spear their own family members, and the deaths were very brutal. They would kill with machete or with a spear, um, but Jim Elliott and Nate Saint heard about these this tribe living in the jungle, and wasn't it five miles from your house that they lived? 
I would think five or more, a little more probably. It, it would take um, just about a full day walk from our house into the in their area, that area. So you were living with your children a day's walk from people who were thought to be cannibals, mm -hmm. basically. Because people back then thought that the Alcas were killing people and eating them mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. But Jim Elliot, God placed it on Jim Elliot's heart that these people needed to hear, the Alcas needed to hear about Jesus. So he and Nate Saint began to plan and... Yeah, can you tell about the yellow plane? Did you ever fly in it? That they're going to be reading about the yellow plane. Oh yes, <laughs> that was just the uh, MAF plane. We had a in the back of our our backyard in Pano was just one long airstrip, uh, so the plane would come right in, right into our back door practically, uh, so we could. Uh, and that was the only where. The only way out was by plane in those early days. We did one trip I did make walking. We walked miles and miles and miles until we got out to the edge of the jungle and in, into Lombato and then up to Quito finally. And But that was the only time I ever went by foot. Uh, later on, of course, with MAF. With the Missionary Aviation Fellowship there, we always went by plane. And your sons threw up many times in that plane, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> the way Bill. my dad would get air sick. Bill especially, yeah. Um, did you know that Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and the other three men were going in to try to live among the Alcas? Yeah. Yeah, you knew that they were doing the bucket drops of the presents. Yeah, that's right. But didn't they keep their mission a secret at first? Yes. Yeah, I, no, we may have known, but uh, it wasn't widely known among the people of the area. No, they wanted it kept quiet. Because their missions didn't approve. Mm -hmm. It was too much of a risk. Oh, it could be in that, too. I don't remember that, but that might be. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you heard that they had been killed? Or that they were missing? I don't remember how the word came to us, but probably through some of the Indians. But what I do remember is some of our Christian Indians, when they heard about it, they were all upset. And they said, let's go in and kill them right away. We said, well, that's not the way a Christian would look at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the way we should think of it. We should think of going in and teaching them about Jesus, how to love, not to kill. <laughs> All the missionaries communicated back and forth on radios, and they, because they were the only people from America there, they all thought of each other as aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters. So when my dad talks about Jim Elliot, he talks about Uncle Jim and Uncle Nate. Um, he didn't know the, the um, other men as well, because uh, Ed McCauley and all of them, because they were stationed in other parts of Ecuador. But they would radio back and forth and stay in touch. And it was on the radio that Grandma and Grandpa first heard that the men were missing. My grandfather was supposed to go with the rescue mission to find them, and they still hoped they were injured but alive. But they had to call the Ecuadorian um, government, the military, to come in because it was so dangerous to even go find them. So the missionaries also didn't know what was happening if the Alcas would come out from the jungle and kill the rest of them because they were very, um, they were very, uh, they gave a lot of reprisals. If they thought you, you had offended them, they would go after and kill your entire family. So they were almost extinct as a people because they killed each other so much. Um, so coming to Christ led them to, to their survival now. And the sad thing is many have actually turned away from the Lord now and are starting to live wild again in the deeper parts of the jungle. I've just read that recently. But there are still many that are faithful to God, but there are pockets that have turned wild and savage again. Um, but my grandfather had the flu, so he was unable to go. He was going to go anyway, but it was March Saint, um, Nate's wife. Her husband was missing. She didn't know what had happened. They thought he was probably dead. And she said to my grandfather, don't go. We can't put all of our eggs in the same basket. If you go and they kill you, then we'll lose all of our missionaries in this area. So she was willing to 
give up her husband's rescue to save my grandfather's from being in danger. Um, so it was a very heartbreaking time because these were their close friends, these were their co-workers, and um, this plane that was destroyed, my father rode in it four times a year when he went back and forth to school in Quito, he was in boarding school. So, you know, the parts that were destroyed, he used to play near that, you know. Um, and he used to ride around on Uncle Nate's shoulders, and Uncle Jim would come and play jokes on him. The, Jim was very, very much a prankster. As serious as he was for the gospel, he was constantly pulling pranks on everybody. So um, after that, it was a very insecure time for the missionaries in, in Ecuador. But then they began hearing stories about what was happening in the United States with people coming to Christ because of, of this what happened with the five men, yes? Was it soon after, or was it a long time? Do you recall? I don't think it was a long time. I think it was soon, soon. I don't recall exactly the time. But not long. So um, we'll have to tell some other parts of the story later on. As you guys are reading Through the Gates of Splendor, remember this is a place that my daddy grew up in that that Miss Caro, Senora Carola, lived and worked. So this isn't an imaginary story. This is real history, and you have living proof before you that this happened. So this is part of my 